Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that's something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will notify you every single time that I post. Anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the murder of 14 year old Caroline Glacken. Now I actually covered this case on my good friend Joshua's channel. It must have been like almost two years ago now but it's one that I think back to often. It's on my mind a lot because it is still an unsolved case and Caroline's family and friends are still waiting for answers and justice. So I decided that I wanted to share Caroline's story with you today and I will leave some contact details in the description box in case anyone watching this has any information regarding Caroline's case. So our case today Day took place in the year 1996 in Dumbartonshire which is a county in the west of Scotland and this is Caroline Glacken she was a 14 year old girl born on the 8th of January 1982 to her parents Margaret and William at the time of Caroline's birth in 1982 Margaret and William were actually living in Northern Ireland because William was a soldier and he was stationed there with the armed forces and Margaret and William were so over the moon when Caroline was born. They described her as being a gift from God because Margaret had had about five miscarriages before Caroline. All of her babies just didn't make it and Caroline was their sixth attempt at having a child. They were so desperate for a baby. Because of their previous pregnancies, William and Margaret were very concerned that Caroline also wouldn't survive. However, in January of 1982, Caroline Caroline came into the world. She was very, very small when she was born. She weighed just over two pounds, but she pulled through and Margaret and William finally had the little family that they had been wishing for for so long. Eventually the family moved from Northern Ireland back to Scotland which is where they were originally from and from what I can gather Caroline just had a really nice normal childhood. She was very close to her parents particularly her mother Margaret and I think they maintained this close bond throughout Caroline's life. However, when Caroline was around seven years old, her parents made the decision to separate and Caroline stayed living with her mother in the town of Bonhill in Dumbartonshire in Scotland. Her father, William, decided to move to the outskirts of Edinburgh, although despite moving, William still maintained regular contact with his daughter. They would still speak all the time and he would visit Caroline every couple of weeks so they still had a very good father-daughter relationship. As Caroline entered her teenage years she was described as being a feisty, quirky and unpredictable young girl who just always had a smile on her face. She had a lot of friends who she loved spending time with at school and at the local youth club and speaking of school Caroline attended St Patrick's High School in Dumbarton and she seemed to really Really enjoy her time there. She was a very popular pupil. Her friends said that she was just a jokester. She would always be laughing and cracking jokes. She just liked to make other people laugh. Caroline was just a typical teenager. She wasn't perfect, you know, sometimes she would rebel against her mother, sometimes she would go places she wasn't meant to go, sometimes she would stay out later than she was allowed. But I mean, that's not exactly unusual. Most teenagers will bend and break the rules here and there. However, a couple of months before this case took place, Caroline actually started a relationship with a boy 
that was 18 years old and he lived in the village of Renton in Western Bartonshire which is not too far from where Caroline lived it was just on the other side of a river known as the River Leven and Caroline's mother Margaret really disapproved of this relationship because well obviously because of the age difference Caroline was only 14 years old she was a child and this boy was 18 and so Margaret felt as though this boy was taking advantage of Caroline apparently this boy was also into drugs and he actually had another girlfriend so he had two girlfriends and so Margaret just didn't want Caroline involved with him however of course if you tell a teenager that they aren't allowed to do something it more than likely just makes them want to do it even more and so Caroline wouldn't listen to her mother and the two would argue over this boy quite a lot but anyway fast forward to the 24th of August 1996 which was a Saturday and that evening Caroline's mother Margaret had plans to go out with a few friends of hers. You see her 40th birthday was coming up soon and so she just wanted to go out and celebrate and have a couple of drinks with friends. So Margaret was just getting ready at home when her daughter Caroline asked if her best friend Joanne Menzies could stay around the house for a sleepover that night and Margaret just said yeah of course she can. And so at around 7pm at that that night Caroline just said goodbye to her mum and she left to go and meet Joanne. However that was the last time Margaret ever saw her 14 year old daughter alive again. Caroline and Joanne met at some shops in Bon Hill with another friend of theirs named Donna and that night Caroline was wearing a black sweatshirt and a pair of jeans. And from what I can gather Caroline and Joanne just spent the evening socialising and hanging hanging out with their friends and the two girls were caught on CCTV around some shops in Bon Hill. In this CCTV image Caroline is the one on the left and Joanne is the one on the right. I believe their plan that night was to just hang out with their friends for a few hours and then eventually they would walk back to Caroline's house for their sleepover. However it got to around midnight and Caroline decided that she didn't want to go home just yet she actually wanted to go and see her 18 year old boyfriend in Renton and she asked her best friend Joanne to walk there with her but Joanne didn't want to it was already dark and she just didn't feel comfortable walking to Renton so late at night and so she said no but that didn't stop Caroline from going and she decided that she was just going to walk to see her boyfriend on her own and so at 11 54 p.m she said goodbye to Joanne and she began her journey to Renton and Joanne walked back to Caroline's house alone she was just going to wait there for her best friend to return but she never did. To get to Renton Caroline would have to walk along a main road and then she would have to walk down an unlit towpath along the River Leven which was under a bridge known as Black Bridge However, Caroline Glacken would never make it to her destination and she never returned home that night. Later that night, Caroline's mother Margaret returned home from her night out with friends and she immediately noticed that Joanne was sleeping but Caroline wasn't next to her. She was nowhere in the house. And so Margaret woke Joanne up and she asked her where Caroline was and Joanne told her that she had gone to Renton to see her boyfriend. And Margaret probably wasn't happy about this because as we know, she disapproved of Caroline's boyfriend. But I don't think at this point she was too worried or panicked because this wasn't unlike Caroline. She would often, you know, stay out later than she was allowed and she would always either return home or she would phone her mum to let her know where she was. So Margaret was just waiting for Caroline's phone call but the phone call never came and the next morning Caroline still wasn't home and Margaret was starting to worry at this point and she said that she just had a feeling a really painful feeling in her heart that something was wrong 
here and so she contacted the police and reported Caroline as missing. She gave the police a description of Caroline and a description of what she had been wearing the previous night and they said that they would start looking for her. But by that Sunday afternoon, rumours were starting to spread around the local area and these rumours were that a body had been discovered in the River Leven. As soon as Caroline's best friend Joanne heard these rumours, she ran back to Caroline's house to tell Margaret. But Margaret tried to comfort Joanne and she told her not to worry because if it was Caroline, she would know. However, not long after this, the police arrived at Margaret's house because they believed that this body that had been found in the river was in fact her daughter, 14-year-old Caroline Glacken. Caroline's body was found half submerged in the River Leven and it's believed that she had been in that water for about 15 hours before being found by a man who was walking his dog along the towpath. He was just walking along the path when he saw an object in the river and at first he thought it was a tailor's dummy but eventually he realised that it wasn't a dummy, it was a dead body and so the police were contacted. Caroline Glacken was the victim of a homicide, she had been murdered and she had suffered a very brutal end. She had very serious head injuries, she had suffered blunt force trauma to the head and this paired with drowning was her cause of death. It's actually not known whether or not she was conscious or unconscious when her body was dumped in the water. Caroline was fully clothed when she was found and there were no signs on her body that indicated she had been sexually assaulted, although her shoes were on the side of the embankment and we don't really know why. We don't know if she took her shoes off herself for whatever reason or if her killer took the shoes off her feet. The police also noticed that there was some blood on the towpath which indicated that she had been attacked while she was walking along the river, along the path, and then her attacker dumped her in the water afterwards where she drowned. So a murder investigation was set up and the police began examining the crime scene for any evidence, however, this was 1996 and because Caroline's body was half submerged in water, they found very little forensic evidence. And so they started conducting fingertip searches just to see if they could find any other evidence, maybe something that the killer had dropped that could identify them. They were doing searches pretty much everywhere around the local area. They were looking around the local school and the local football ground. As well as this, the police also conducted door-to-door -door inquiries and they were just asking everyone in the area if they knew anything or if they had seen anything on the night that Caroline was killed. And they also did public appeals urging anyone with any information about the murder inquiry to come forward but they received very little tips and this made it even more difficult for the police because if they don't have any forensic evidence in a case then they pretty much rely solely on witnesses and people coming forward with information but no one was doing that in this investigation so they were kind of stuck. It almost felt like there were people in the community that did have information regarding Caroline's murder but they seemed to be keeping very tight-lipped. They were holding what they knew back, maybe because they were scared, maybe they knew the identity of Caroline's killer but they were terrified of giving their name over to the police because if they did they might suffer the same fate. But the police did receive a couple of tips from members of the public that they believed were significant in this case. The first tip was from a local taxi driver and he came forward to the police and said that on the night that Caroline was murdered, he actually saw her 
he was the last person to see her alive that night. He actually said that both he and his passenger in his taxi saw Caroline and they knew that it was her because they both knew her quite well. They said that they saw Caroline sometime around like quarter past, half past midnight and she was walking down a street called Dilly Chip Lone towards the Black Bridge and the River Leven. The taxi driver said that Caroline was walking along alone and that nothing really seemed off with her she didn't look nervous or anything she just looked completely normal however he did notice that there was a man standing about 30 yards behind Caroline and he looked as though he was just kind of watching her. The taxi driver described this man as being around 20 to 25 years old. He said that he looked around five foot six in height. He was wearing a dark green hoodie and his hood was up and apparently he had very sharp facial features. Another tip the police received came from two men who were out walking their dogs on the night that Caroline was murdered and they said that they remembered hearing a commotion. They could hear like an argument or something going on but they said that they could only hear one voice, one person speaking and it sounded like a woman's voice possibly Caroline's. It was difficult for the men to tell what this person was saying. Apparently at one point they thought they heard her say, I didn't do that and also I didn't say that. So it sounded like she was responding to someone else. But to be honest, they didn't really think much of it at the time. They just assumed that it was probably a couple arguing. But now the police were thinking that maybe it was Caroline Glacken. Maybe she was arguing with her killer before she died. Maybe that means she knew who her killer was. There were a couple of other witnesses that came forward to the police and said that they also heard a commotion that night. And the police also received another statement from a witness who said that around 12.45 a.m. on the night that Caroline was murdered, they saw two men in the area not far from where Caroline's body was discovered and these two men were running. And one of these two men had a dark colored hoodie on with the hood over his head, just like the man the taxi driver described seeing. So were these two men Caroline's killers running away from the scene? About two months after Caroline's murder, the police put together a composite sketch of the man in the dark colored hoodie that was seen by two witnesses. And this sketch was released to the public in the hopes that someone would recognize him and come forward. But despite this, the police have never been able Able to trace him they've never been able to identify this man they don't even know if he was the killer or if he was involved in Caroline's murder but he could have been and they have no idea who he is now some of you may be thinking what about Caroline's 18 year old boyfriend we know that on the night of her death she was going to visit him so could he have had anything to do with her murder that night the night that Caroline was killed he had been hanging out with a couple of friends of his in a house in Renton so when Caroline's body was found and this was determined to be a murder inquiry the police went to this house where the boyfriend had been that night and they forensically searched it for any evidence that could link him to the murder of Caroline but there was nothing. I also read on one source that he did have a rock solid alibi for the time of the murder so he was pretty much ruled out as a suspect and from what I can gather there haven't really been any other person of interest in this case. I couldn't find any more information online about other suspects so I don't know if there have been any over the years and that information just hasn't been released to the public or whether there genuinely hasn't been 
any suspects in Caroline's murder. This August, it will be 25 years since Caroline's death and the identity of her killer is still unknown and her family are still waiting for justice. According to a couple of news articles from 2017, the police recently reopened Caroline's cold case and they launched a new appeal for information hoping that they would finally uncover the truth. Now after Caroline Caroline's murder, the police collected over 300 pieces of evidence related to her case. But I don't actually know what any of this evidence was. That bit of information also hasn't been released to the public. But in 2016 slash 2017, when this case was reopened, Detective Superintendent Jim Kerr announced that forensic scientists were going to carefully re-examine these pieces of evidence for traces of DNA the killer's DNA. He said, quote, a large number of the 300 pieces of evidence continue to be carefully examined for traces of DNA and the painstaking work that the scientists have been carrying out continues. Following our reappeal, we've had calls from as far away as Australia with information from people who lived in the area of Bon Hill and Renton at the time of the murder. Our work over the last year has continued to review the initial investigation and visiting those who were witnesses at the time to take reference samples of DNA. We remain in contact with Caroline's mother Margaret and the support we receive from her and her family during our investigation remains crucial. From what I can tell they haven't been able to get any traces of DNA from this evidence yet but I believe they are still actively looking into this case today. The detectives have said that they believe the truth about what happened to Caroline that night in August of 1996 lies within the local community, but the people are just reluctant to come forward for whatever reason. Maybe they are scared of the killer or maybe the killer is a relative of theirs and they feel like they would be betraying them if they gave their name over to the police. Like I said, it's almost been 25 years since Caroline's murder. That's 25 years that her family and friends have had to live without answers, which is insane. I just hope that if there is someone out there that knows the truth, they will find the strength and the courage to contact the police. You can even do it anonymously if you don't want to give your name over. As I mentioned at the start of the video, I will leave some contact details in the description box in case anyone watching this video has any information regarding Caroline's murder. And yeah, that is it for this video. That is the case of Caroline Glacken. I will let you guys know if there are any updates or developments in the case. As usual, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. Before I go, I do just want to say a huge thank you to the members of my Patreon page. Thank you so, so much for your support, guys. If anyone else wants to become a member of our little Patreon family, then the link is always in the description box of my videos. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!